Uh, thanks very much. I do want to thank the organizers for uh, permitting me to be part of such an august group of investigators. It really is a pleasure. I've learned quite a bit and uh, enjoyed uh, hearing what everybody's had to say. As an interventional cardiologist, and I am a clinician uh, by trade, uh, I spend my days uh, really destroying the endothelium and my nights thinking about how best to improve it. So I think uh, um, uh, I, I, I look forward to discussing this. And, and I, I do hope that to engage you in some open discussion, because the topics that have been brought up so far uh, tonight and, and uh, will be brought up again in the ensuing talks are really pertinent to the thoughts that we've been uh, exploring with EECP. And continuing this uh, evolution of, of uh, thinking will be important for us, I think. Um, as has been clearly pointed out, endothelial balance, endothelial function is, is uh, central to our well-being. Normal endothelial function involves a balance between factors, good factors being nitric oxide, prostaglandins, bad factors, simplistically, again, I'm an interventional cardiologist, endothelins, angi angiotensin. But that leads to vasodilatation, atheroprotective properties that are critical for us. Um, when endothelium is out of balance, when, it's, when there's endothelial dysfunction, of course, there's relatively less good and relatively more bad. You could vasoconstriction and, and uh, an atherogenic uh, process. And I, uh, I was very pleased to hear about the endothelial uh, repair mechanism being discussed because depletion of EPCs are uh, an intrinsic part of endothelial dysfunction. And more uh, generally, as I want to point out later in the talk, uh, hemo, hemo uh, poetic precursor cells are really central to this process of endothelial dysfunction, restoring endothelial balance, endothelial function, and may have implications for how external counterpulsation actually works. Endothelial dysfunction, of course, uh, is associated with risk factors and a disease state. The more risk factors you have, as was pointed out nicely, uh, the worse your endothelial function tends to be. Um, see that uh, you can uh, fairly uh, uh, delineate a, a linear relationship between the number of risk factors and uh, endothelial function measured invasively. And in fact, uh, endothelial dysfunction is associated with myocardial ischemia. So if you measure uh, um, exercise thallium tests, even in the absence of uh, obstructive coronary disease, you can see that in patients with abnormal functional tests, their responsiveness to acetylcholine is impaired. They have impaired endothelial function, even in the absence of coronary disease. And so this is a very early marker, as was pointed out earlier, of endothelial or of uh, atherosclerotic disease and of the risk state. It really leads to that whole concept of a vulnerable patient who's uh, got a global uh, process that's deranged and endothelial dysfunction. Our group um, looked carefully at long-term outcomes. So I've shown you that risk factors are associated with poor endothelial function. Endothelial function uh, or dysfunction can be associated with ischemia and other markers of, of bad outcome. But actually, endothelial dysfunction is associated with bad outcome itself, as has been pointed out in earlier talks. And so by measuring endothelial function peripherally in this case with, uh, with the endopatch or peripheral arterial tonometry, uh, our, our group showed that patients with uh, endothelial dysfunction had worse long-term outcome over a period of five to seven years compared to people with normal endothelial function. And this is not due just to increased hospitalization, but this is due primarily to mortality. So it's a very profound marker of adverse events. Shear stress, it turns out, is atheroprotective. It hasn't really been brought up uh, uh, as much today. But shear stress is a very potent effector of vascular health. And so by promoting shear stress in the right dose, perhaps we can have a beneficial effect on uh, endothelial function. And so that got us thinking about how this external counterpulsation that uh, Aslam showed you uh, uh, has great effects on angina scores and quality of life and maybe prognosis, but maybe endothelial function has a role in how that, uh, how we can put that together and how ECP works. Um, and so, in fact, uh, we looked at all of the uh, effects that ECP has. ECP has a global effect on flow and shear stresses throughout the body. So as Islam said, uh, there's um, diastolic augmentation 
systolic unloading, just like a balloon pump. So there's an increase in cardiac output, and you can demonstrate increased flow, pulsatile flow, throughout the vascular tree in all major vascular distributions. This has been demonstrated in the animal model. Um, uh, in pigs treated with ECP, you can see their shear forces pre and during ECP. There's a fairly dramatic, 100% uh, really, doubling of uh, shear forces in the intact animal. And this has a variety of effects, and in this particular case, they measured ENOS levels in those pigs, and it was, uh, it was uh, positively affected in both controls and in patients, or in, and in pigs uh, who were in a disease state. In the uh, pigs that were in a disease state that did not have ECP, there was no benefit uh, uh, or no change over time in the ENOS levels or an intimate media uh, thickness ratio. Uh, other actors associated with external counterpulsation and uh, vascular health include nitric oxide and endothelial levels. These were actually measured, and as you can see on this graph, because ECP is a prolonged course, it's a seven-week course of therapy, you can measure effects over time, and here you see a dose-dependent relationship between the good actor, the peripheral circulating nitric oxide levels, a decrease, a dose-dependent decrease in endothelial levels that uh, persists over the treatment time out to uh, seven weeks, and then a gradual reduction back towards normal, uh, or back towards the baseline state after the cessation of therapy. Uh, this has also been shown, interestingly, with uh, angiotensin and other factors. We looked at this in the intact human then uh, in a different way. We, we wanted to measure peripheral arterial uh, tonometry or a measure of endothelial function. I already showed you that this does have an implication for prognosis. It has an implication for symptoms uh, and uh, ischemic burden. Uh, and so what we did is we developed a, a protocol by which we uh, um, put a patient at rest, inflated a blood pressure cuff. Um, for five minutes, deflated the cuff and measured uh, their, their uh, peripheral tonometry for 10 minutes. You see you get a uh, tracing much like this. Uh, the uh, tonometry resistance index or the uh, uh, RPH index is the ratio of the post-occlusion pressure uh, divided by the pre-occlusion pressure. So you get a ratio. And uh, in fact, that ratio has been looked at. Somebody asked the question about whether this has been established in the disease state versus the healthy state. And there is a, at least a ratio for the peripheral arterial tonometry for health versus disease state. So in patients with invasively measured coronary endothelial levels that are abnormal, so people have coronary endothelial dysfunction, their tonometry um, index is roughly 1.2 on average whereas in normal cases, it's close to 1.8 or 2. So there's a fairly dramatic and measurable difference in the disease state versus the, uh, the normals. We used that information uh, in our patients undergoing ECP. So we took uh, 25 patients, measured each, uh, or measured on three separate occasions during treatment, uh, the first day, middle day, and the end day, their uh, peripheral tonometry both before uh, treatment and after treatment. What we found, interestingly, was that in yellow, the pretreatment endothelial measurement was the same on each of those days. Not sure why that was, it surprised us. We had hoped it would, uh, it would look better, but what we did find is that the, at the end of treatment, um, their uh, peripheral arterial tonometry measurements actually improved more towards a normal level. Remember again, that endothelial dysfunction level about 1.2, so they exceeded that, they, their endothelial function improved. We also verified that they did not have a change in their uh, nitroglycerin responsiveness and other, other factors that may play a role. And so this seemed to be a real endothelial dependent, endothelial function effect of ECP. And when we measured again out at a month after treatment, so they've had seven weeks of therapy, then we measured a month out, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, their resting endothelial function, by and large, was improved. So uh, again, to a not a dramatically normal level, but it was improved from baseline, and that was statistically significant. I think a powerful um, confirmation of this effect is that this kind of change was only seen in those people who had symptomatic benefits. So in the 75% of patients who felt symptomatically better after a course of therapy, 
they had improved endothelial function, whereas those patients who did not have that clinical benefit did not show that change in endothelial function uh, before and at the end of the treatment, whether you measured it by quality of life nitrate uh, scores or the DAISY quality of life score. Another question was, has it been shown, is there an association between precursor cell measurements and, uh, uh, and the uh, ECP? And in fact, we looked at that as well. So prior studies in our group had looked at, um, at uh, both hematopoietic precursor cell levels, and you can see all of the um, types there, as well as the EPC, uh, what we, the putative EPC um, uh, groups. And in normals, you can see on the left of this graph, uh, the normals had, uh, had those levels uh, circulating peripherally at baseline. People with measured <coughs> coronary endothelial dysfunction had dramatically reduced, as was pointed out earlier, dramatically reduced uh, levels of these circulating uh, uh, progenitors. The, hematopo the hematopoietic, the HPCs, I'll say, uh, um, were reduced. The um, EPCs tended to be about the same in both groups in our, in our, in our population. Um, this is an old population, so some of this is related to age and other risk factors, but uh, the coronary endothelial dysfunction group definitely had decreased levels of these things. Now when we looked in our groups going, undergoing ECP, what we found is that the EPC uh, levels didn't change very much, but actually the HPC levels increased again in a dose-dependent fashion uh, during the time of therapy, suggesting anyway that there is some modulatory effect, whether this is healthful or not is a little bit unclear, but there is a response. So uh, whether this is, uh, you know, related to preconditioning or uh, just modulation of the endothelial function, humoral uh, processes is unclear, but these things are, are going on. In the intact human, this has been investigated in a variety of ways, uh, and I think what we're going to move on towards, again, being a clinician, the thing that uh, uh, interests us is the diastolic function, and diastolic function has been modulated or shown to be modulated by ECP as well, possibly all within this realm of, uh, of endothelial uh, function, uh, humoral or cellular components and changes during the course of therapy. Uh, and this, uh, this graph just shows that and diastolic function actually did improve after a course of therapy. So there are a variety of uh, clinically apparent interventions that improve endothelial function, uh, primary of which actually is exercise. And as a, uh, as a pulsatal sort of diastolic augmenting process, ECP is really similar I think to exercise, and so as a passive means of exercise, I think ECP can be put in this group of, of interventions that does have a role in modulating endothelial function. And so as a bottom line, I'd like to say that optimal medical therapy and risk factor modification are essential to improve endothelial function. I didn't really go over any of that, but it's, it's true. Um, and ECP actually provides safe, effective, durable symptom relief, as Aslam uh, showed, and is associated with improved quality of life and vascular health. And there's, it's a potential pathway to improve prognosis, I think, and of course that's a stretch uh, for us in science, but it, the markers that are modulated are associated with better outcomes, and so it modulates it, maybe it improves prognosis via plaque modification, vascular function, and myocardial performance uh, effects, as I talked about in my discussion. And that's all I've got. Thanks.